places in the scripture. They do the service while the son possesses the authority. So the son is better than the angels. Better than the old covenant. The new covenant is better than the old covenant. Ministering for those who will inherit salvation. Remember verse 2 of our, of our chapter 1. He has appointed heir of all things. Who is that? All those who receive salvation. We become heirs and joint heirs with Jesus Christ, right? We know that if you've been in church long, you've heard that more than once. Heirs and joint heirs of Jesus Christ. How did it happen? It only happened because the Son came. And the Son brought salvation into the world. A new covenant, a living covenant, not destroying the old, but doing what? Fulfilling the old. Fulfilling the old, but a new covenant bringing eternal salvation for all who would believe. And so believers inherit salvation from the Son. What a connection, friends, huh? <laughs> what a connection. Hallelujah. Christ and his people. In, in Hebrews chapter 2, down in verse 11, he goes, he, he goes on to say, I'll just read it. Both he who sanctifies and those who are being sanctified are all one, for which reason he is not ashamed to call them <coughs> brethren or brothers. I have no problem at all and I realized that uh, the macho thing in our world for years has kind of been torn down some in some areas. But I have no problem at all saying to my brothers, I love you. When I hang up the phone, say, love you, brother. And they say the same thing back. Why? Because we're brothers. <laughs> we're brethren. <laughs> See? We belong to the same family. And so here's the spiritual element of that. When Christ came into the world, when God sent his son, bringing salvation, those who would believe inherited salvation and became what? Brothers and sisters. You understand, the scripture is a neutral term. What a wonderful, what a wonderful thing here. In Romans chapter, Paul, when he writes Romans, chapter, writes Romans in chapter eight, verse 17, he calls us heirs of God and joint heirs with Jesus Christ. So moving on. Therefore, verse, chapter 2, we must give the more earnest heed to the things we have heard, lest we drift away. For you that have been here previous Sundays, we talked about Hebrews being a, being a book that is to keep us on track serving the Lord so that we do not drift away. Of course, there's a certain theology that's preached a lot in East Tennessee that you can never drift away. That's just not true for us. I will never have salvation forced upon me. I have salvation because I receive it and accept it. And God is never going to force me to go to heaven. <laughs> And he's never going to keep me out of hell except for the fact that I accept what he has provided for me called salvation. And I maintain it. So here, notice what he says in chapter 2. We must give, and, and notice the word must here. Well, let me back up first to the word therefore. Years ago, one of my professors said to us, anytime you see the word therefore in the Bible, you need to find out what it's there for. <laughs> <laughs> you need to figure out what it's there for. You, all of you understand that the chapters and verses we have in the Bible were not made that way originally. They, they were later, many later years, put into chapters and verses. But therefore is connected to the previous verses of chapter 1. He didn't make his he never told his angels to sit at his right hand, but he did tell his son, and the angels do a work, a service work, in the salvation process to those who are saved. But Christ brings salvation, therefore, it ties it together. That word ties it to the previous verses. Notice then, therefore, we 
we must here we have the first of several exhortations in the epistle New Testament, the New Testament writers were acutely aware of the need for application of theology. Remember I said here a couple Sundays ago that when I taught at the college, I always did my best to make sure that the students somehow made application to what we were talking about in their own lives application in their own lives. Not application in the, in the professor's life, application in their lives as of what we're dealing with in these verses and what we're talking about. Always be thinking and always figuring out with your own mind, now where does this apply in my life? How, how does this figure in to where I'm living right now and where I'm going to live down the road? Who knows? God only. But the writers of the, of the, of the New Testament scriptures were, were particularly aware of the need that, that the readers and the listeners would be able to apply the theology that they were talking about. One of the things that I used to say in the beginning of every class that I taught, I would, in fact, I would put it in my syllabus, I would say something to the effect, look, there's nothing more important in this class than for me to do my best to answer whatever questions you may have. Now, you, you did understand what I said then, in that, didn't you? <laughs> to do my best. <laughs> that doesn't mean I always had all the answers. I mean, especially the college students, you know how that works. But, but I meant that because, hear me friends, and you may want to write this down, theology without application is nothing more than mental exercise. <clears throat> if your theology has no application in your life, you might as well be, be reading Plato or anything else you want to call, call by name. Theology without application is nothing more than mental exercise. 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 6, Paul says in that letter, to the, the second letter to the Corinthians, the letter without the spirit is dead, or is death. If there's no spirit in it, if there's no application in it, and I, and I probably could say with, with Pastor Tom, been talking about the past couple Sundays, let's put a, a little S with that spirit, meaning the human, and a big S with that spirit, meaning the Holy Spirit. The letter without the spirit is dead. And so the writers in Hebrews are serious about this, they say in verse 2, therefore we must. The exhortation here is the holding fast of your profession, which we will pick up on in, in chapter 4. That very phrase in chapter 4, verse 14, about holding fast your profession. I told you about a friend of mine, and he's still my friend, even though we disagree. And he wants to argue with me about it all the time. It, he, he says to me, well, Bob, you know, we can't lose our salvation. <coughs> and I let him say to them, that to me about seven times before I finally said, Charlie, you don't know what you're talking about. And oh boy, we were on the golf course when this was going on. Mm -hmm. And we got into an interesting discussion. Now, I also understand that you can't lose it because somebody else takes it away from you. But guess what? You can deny it and go your own way. And backsliding is not a creation of man's mental gymnastics. It's a reality in Scripture. Paul said of Demas, he has forsaken me and gone the other direction. 
What's that mean? He has left what he was, what he used to believe, and he's gone on his own way. Jesus, at one point in his ministry, said to some of those people that were following him, because some of them began to leave. He said, well, we don't want him for this gospel anymore. And Jesus even turned to some of those that day. I can't give the reference right now, but you can find it. He said to them, are you too going to leave? Some of you, are you also going to leave me? So the, the, the scripture of the Hebrews deals with the subject of drifting away, of slipping away. The word here is we must, not that we ought to or the, not that we should. This passage is a strong warning, very serious passage. We must give the more, the more earnest heed. How would you, how would you, how would you vocalize? The term more earnest heed. Well, you know, I mean, we don't, we don't call it. We wouldn't say those terms, would we? Must give them more earnest heed. Pay special attention. Pay special attention. That'd be one way to say it, right? <coughs> Any other ideas? Take it seriously. Take it seriously. Yeah. Have you ever been talking to your kids or your grandkids and you said something like, you better keep listening to me or you better listen to me? Huh? <laughs> now whether or not they did it, that's something else, but what was the message? You better give earnest heed to what's being said here. I don't know if he would, if he would back me up on this, but I'm gonna say it anyway. Uh, every so often, you know, when Pastor Tom's preaching, during his sermon, he'll say something about, everybody look this way. Yeah. <laughs> and I always, I always say to myself, uh-huh. What he's really trying to say is, listen. <laughs> everybody listen to what I'm saying here. I don't want you to miss it. Like I said, he may not back that up, but I, I believe that's what's going on. So <laughs> I may be wrong. But anyway, hey, the word's clear. We must, not optional, we must give the more earnest heed. If the prophets, if the Old Testament prophets and even the angels should be heard as they ministered in times past, how much more should the Son be heard? The gospel of the Son, the gospel of Jesus. So the writer says, we must give the more earnest heed. W. H. Griffith Thomas, one of the great, great uh, commentators of past past years, said said it like this. He said one of the one of the great dangers of the Christian life is losing interest in what is familiar. Think about that for a little bit. One of the great dangers in the Christian life is losing interest in what is familiar. John Wesley, one of the great heroes of the faith, way back in the 1400s when he did his thing and Methodism came out of it, for you historians, John Wesley way back then said these words, and I quote, he, he, he did, he did a, a, I don't remember if it was a sermon or if a right, a, a writing, just a writing, but anyway, he said this. He said, I am not afraid that the people called Methodist should ever cease to exist either in Europe or America. But I am afraid lest they should only exist as a dead sect, S-E-C-T, having the form of religion without the power. And this undoubtedly will be the case unless they hold fast both the doctrine, spirit, and discipline with which they first set out. That's a powerful statement, friends. 
That's a powerful. And think of it. He said that in the 1400s. And I'm here to tell you, we have lived, lived to see it happen. We have. We have lived to see it happen in American churches. Is it any wonder that the Holy Spirit inspired the writer to say, it's not optional, friends. If you're going to live for Jesus, you must hold on to it. You must hold on to it. You must hold fast. My, my granddaughter years ago, about that big or so, I was out in the yard mowing, I guess, and she was walking the landscape timbers, you know, around the flowers. And I was, I'd watch her, you know, and I was mowing around. I, I went the other direction or something and came back around and she was no, nowhere, nowhere to be seen. Walking the landscape timbers one minute, and the next minute she was gone. I'd immediately shut down the, the, the mower and jumped off and went around the house. No, she wasn't around there. Called her by name, no answer. We lived out in the country, swamp across the street, <laughs> down the hill, and you know, you know how your mind plays tricks in a hurry. How easily to be lost. How easily to be lost. Did you find her? I did find her, thank <laughs> Jesus. I did find her. She was down the road. She, she decided to go visit the neighbor somewhere down, down the street. Neighbors that she didn't even know, but she was going to go visit the neighbor. This epistle lays great stress, and I'd encourage you to take a note, put in great big letters in your notes, the word steadfastness. Because this epistle lays great stress upon being steadfast. Steadfast. We know that verse also, don't we? Another, another verse. Steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. Corinthians. I don't have a reference on that either, but it's there somewhere. So, we must give a more earnest heed. Without earnest heed, it gets lost. That's the point. We can think of somebody right now. You can think of somebody, and I can right now. We didn't pay close attention to their experience with Christ, to their relationship with the Lord. And today they're lost. You say, well, who are you to judge? I'm not the judge. I'll be going to God. But I'm here to tell you, friends, the scripture talks about that. And we need to quit being deceived by this whole idea that one shot does everything. I've never had a shot yet in my life that did everything for me. How about you? And yes, and by the way, these folks that I'm thinking about, that I've pastored over the years, that now are no longer serving Jesus, have gone away, have drifted away, they really were saved. Because that's the argument sometimes. Well, they were not saved in the first place. That's a silly argument. They were saved. They were genuinely saved. But they let it slip away. They let it drift away. It's like Brianna, you know. No time she's gone. She just slipped away. I didn't see her. She did it on her own. I didn't make her. She did it on her own. Matthew chapter 22, verse 5, Jesus tells the parable of the wedding feast and the invited guests. We know that story, don't we? Where there was a wedding feast, they invited all the guests. But 22, verse 5, in that story that Jesus tells, the parable, these are, these are absolutely, uh, what, what shall I call it? Not only forceful, but scary, for lack of a better word. They had been invited to the wedding feast. It didn't cost them anything. <laughs> it was going to be a great event. People were getting married. They were going to be a part of the wedding crowd, whatever and so forth. Matthew 22 says, but some of them made light of it. Even when the master had said, come on. And we all understand in the parables. Christ is saying, come to the feast. Come to the wedding. That 
some made light of it. Man, how careful we must be. So notice what he says, verse 1, give the more earnest heed, give the more earnest heed to the things we have heard, lest we drift away. Or another translation says, lest, lest we slip, or let, lest we slip. The word here has several allegorical implications. One is slipping away or vanishing, like Brianna did, just all of a sudden, out of my sight. Not there anymore. That's kind of like evaporation. Insufficient heat to the gospel, and it will vanish away. Did you hear me? I said insufficient heat to the gospel will vanish away. You say, well, preacher, why does it do that? Because the devil wants it to do that. The enemy wants it to slip away in your life. And mine. He wants it to evaporate, where things become not nearly as important as they used to be, and little by little, guess what? Nothing's important, because the only thing that's important in my, my life is what I want to do, and where I want to be, and how I want to live, etc., etc., etc. So slipping away is one of the allegories. Leaking is the other idea, like a faulty container. This week I had a I had a bathroom uh, commode that wouldn't quit running. You know those 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 wonderful things that happen in your house. You had to, the only way you could get to keep from running, you had to get down on the floor and turn water off. You know, to the commode. So I had to go get me the new guts, for lack of a better word, forgive that word, but anyway, to put in there. So. I flushed it, of course, and it went all down. I turned the water off, so there was just, but there was still not so much water in the bottom of the tank. And you had to get that out because when you take that gizmo out that runs the water in, it'd run out that hole <laughs> on the floor. So I thought, aha, I got a, I got a shop back. I'll just suck that water right out of there, and that'll be the slickest way. I used to always put a rag in there dip it out and squeeze it in a bucket, you know, and then squeeze it in a bucket. We're not talking about the Como part, we're talking about the tank, for right. instance, <laughs> the, the tank. Anyway, no, I'm going to go, so I got my little shot back out, <laughs> no time, it's all gone. It had one of those blue things hanging in there that puts the blue in the water, you know, whatever you call them, those oh, sanitizer, the other thing or whatever it is hanging in there. And I saw it, I said, I didn't care, that didn't affect what I was doing. And so that water was all blue. I sucked that water out of there. No time, man, I was ready to work on it. I just happened to see out of the corner of my eye, there was blue water all over the tile floor <laughs> with white grout <laughs> between the tile. Oh, no. And I grabbed that vacuum thing and took it running outside, turned it upside down, and <laughs> looked at it, and there was a crack in the bottom of my <laughs> vacuum. Oh no. About that long. Had no idea because I hardly ever put water in it. I usually just use it for sawdust and you know stuff like that. Well then I had my enjoyment of trying to get that blue out of that those white the grout, that white grout on the tile. But the point is, it leaked. If we don't pay attention to our salvation, it leaks. Because a devil will put a crack in it. In any way he can. And by the way, friends, let me just say quickly, for all of us that have grandchildren now instead of just children. This is serious business with teenagers. Serious business with the teenage mind. Even more so now than it was when you and I were teenagers. Because the enemy has so many different ways to put the crack in it. And the next thing you know it's leaking. It's not nearly so important to go to church as it used to be. Not nearly so important to read my Bible. I can always do that later. You know, not so important to pray. I can pray anytime, anywhere. 
So slipping away is one idea, leaking is the other idea here, drifting away, as it says, drift away, like a boat that has slipped from its moorings. Everything seems, seems the same. The post is still there, the cleat is still there, but the boat's gone. <laughs> I'm in South Florida, Joel and Charlotte. I was in Okeechobee, Florida, and my phone rang a few years ago. Hey, Bob, yeah, well, this is your neighbor. Yeah, okay, well, well, I just thought you might like to know that your pontoon boat's gone. When I left, I had it tied to the dock <laughs> behind my house. I said, gone? How can it be gone? I, well, I don't know, but it's gone. I mean, literally, gone. Well, where is it? I don't know. I just thought you might want to know it's gone, as if I could do something about it in Okeechobee, Florida. You know, but make a long story short, they had a bad storm came up that cold, boy, and the mountain winds came off the, came off the mountains, tore it, literally tore it loose from the moorings, and it went up the cove. Luckily, one of my neighbors, a long ways from me, somebody called up Gary, and Gary got it back for me. <laughs> and by the time I got back home, it was back on the moorings. <laughs> but if you're not careful, it can drift away, see? And that's what the writer's talking about here. Very, very serious business. Samson and Delilah, Judges chapter 16. We all know this story, don't we? Samson found out about Delilah and what happened to him. His heart went a flutter, right? All of a sudden, he had no good sense about himself at all. Just like most of us men over the years. And Delilah kept trying to what? Find out about his strength. Remember the story? And he told her one thing, and that didn't work. He told her another thing, and that didn't work. Finally, the third time around, he told her the truth. Which, by the way, was dumber than a box of rocks. But he did anyway. And the Philistines came upon him, the scripture says. And what does the Bible say about Samson? He wist not that the spirit had departed from him. That's the way the King James says it. He didn't even understand that the Spirit was no longer upon him because he'd given away his secret that God had told him not to give away. So it can happen, friends. One day I'm sitting in my office and, 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 and my phone rings and a frantic, frantic young lady, a, a, a grown lady, was on the phone. Oh, Pastor, Pastor, you, you, you have to, go, you have to go, go to the hospital right now. My, my, my dad is in the hospital and he had a serious heart attack and they say he's not going to make it and, and, and you, you need to get to the hospital right right now. So what did a good pastor do? Out of my office, into the car, and to the hospital. The minute I walked into the room and he saw me, he knew, of course, knew who I was because he was from my church. However, he had not been coming to that church since I'd been the pastor. And I'd been the pastor for a few years already. But as soon as I walked, as soon as I walked into that room, he started spewing out all of these wonderful words about how much he loved Jesus. Oh, I love Jesus. Oh, Pastor, I love Jesus. And on and on and on it went. Now I understand that because when you're <laughs> When you're facing eternity, you better love Jesus, right? I mean, I understand that. And, and so I, I accept that. I don't stay at San and say, no, you don't. <laughs> you know, I'm not going to do that. But, but I also knew, knew who he was and knew where he had been or where he hadn't been, <laughs> for example. But he went on for some time talking about how, what a wonderful Christian he was and how he loved Jesus. And the truth is, he hadn't been in church for years. How many of you know that the church is the house of God and not the only place we can meet with God, but it is a place where we meet with God with other believers? And we'll get into that in 
later chapters here in Hebrews when it tells us about church. He had not been there. If he had been there two times in all the, in the years that I've been pastor, it probably was more than I can remember. I'm afraid. I was afraid then that his boat had drifted away. That his boat had drifted away. And so I'm saying to myself as I'm standing in that room, and of course I stayed there a little while and prayed with him and, and so forth. And, and I, as I'm leaving, I hope I said to myself, I hope he means business. I hope he means business. Sad to say, I hardly ever saw him again after he got out of the hospital. It wasn't because he's going to some other church. He wasn't going at all. I know, I, I knew that for a fact. The point is, our distractions and our conflicting commitments of today's society can cause our faith to evaporate if we do not give our esteem. And hear me, friends. Our faith is not there on the man. Some people think Jesus is like a light switch. Just whenever you need him, you can turn on the light switch. But if you don't really need him at the moment, go on and do your own thing. Live your own life. Don't worry about it. Friends, the Lord, the Bible, the church must be our priority. The Lord, the Bible, the church must be our priority. Everything else is secondary. How did Jesus say it when he was here on earth? If I start the verse, the rest of you can finish it. Seek ye first the kingdom of God, and all of these other things shall be in. Seek ye what? First the kingdom of God. And then everything else will take care of itself with the help of the Lord in your life and